Hey, good morning. This is Daniela. Just doing a quick check of audio and uh, see if anybody else is on the webinar. Great. It looks like people are joining. We'll give just a minute for uh, people to get logged on. Okay, so just have a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, first, I just want to welcome everybody um, to the webinar. Um, it is in listen-only mode um, during the uh, presentation portion. Um, so please uh, submit your questions through the questions tab, um, which you'll see in your uh, control panel. Um, that way we can collect the questions throughout the duration of the broadcast, and we can get to those um, at the end of the uh, presentation portion. Um, we have uh, the webinar um, scheduled through 1130, which should allow plenty of time for uh, Q&A um, for that last half hour. Uh, my name is Daniela Leifer, and I'm an ombudsman with CUNY and the project manager for the Smart DG Hub. Um, and we'll have Derek Meister, also an ombudsman with CUNY, um, presenting first, followed by Mike Bose, uh, another CUNY ombudsman, um, who will discuss uh, the um, sort of overarching um, project uh, description um, of the 9540A data utilization uh, effort. And um, then we'll uh, end with Victoria Carey, who will go into a little bit more depth about the current um, topic that's being discussed as part of this project, uh, which is on explosion. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Derek. Thanks, Daniela. Uh, again, as she mentioned, I am Derek Meister, uh, and I'm both in with CUNY. And just to get right into the presentation, I'm um, going to start off with a little intro. Um, as you can see, uh, our contact information for the order of presenters, um, we have a couple of ombudsmen from, from Sustainable CUNY, um, and then Victoria Carey from DNBGL who's been providing uh, key technical assistance uh, from, from the beginning of this effort. Next slide. Right, so again, I'm gonna start off with a little background. I'm sure many of you have seen our Lithium Ion Outdoor Guide that we had published uh, about a little less than a year ago, uh, working pretty closely with FDNY and DOB to go over some major Lithium Ion considerations. And then, of course, um, up as a part of that effort, recognizing um, large-scale testing and, and data coming from those tests that need to inform how batteries can be safely designed and operated per various site conditions. Um, and, and that is, of course, the major topic and uh, latest working group that we're working on right now with, with the agencies. Um, and Mike and Victoria will go a little bit further into those details. So of course, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sustainable CUNY at large. Um, it's been around for over a decade, starting off with solar infrastructure considerations uh, around the state as well as in the city, and utilizing our, our connections and, and resources as a university to, to be that neutral third party of facilitators um, to get the right stakeholders at the table, um, and, and, and experts and, and then have the right discussions and ideas about how to move progress forward. Um, 
let alone solar, going into resource development, um, and of course, resiliency at large around when, of course, Hurricane Sandy hit and uh, affected New York City, especially in a huge way, uh, which was a part of the advent of the Smart DG Hub uh, overall. Excellent. So the Smart DG Hub uh, utilizes our uh, familiar framework of connecting um, the right people to the table to, to get these discussions going. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of work went into getting that outdoor lithium ion guide um, published and uh, distributed to to all the stakeholders and, and, and industry personnel who who uh, need to use the uh, the resources to to figure out how to move forward with within the, the current landscape. Um, next slide. So we did publish our lead acid guide a few years before this. Um, those were the early days of kind of energy storage considerations for, for battery technology uh, uh, being different than uh, emergency or uh, UPS system uh, with, with all the major kind of considerations that come with that for um, the, the extra discharging and, and charging cycles. Um, so right now, we are still, of course, looking at the data that we need to actually inform uh, correctly and safely what um, what all these requirements should ultimately turn into, potentially, um, let alone just understanding uh, the, the impacts of energy storage onto battery systems, uh, especially within the density of our city. Um, and we do have a, a framework for a working group um, that Mike will go into a little bit more uh, with uh, numerous SMEs and, of course, the, the AHJs of DOB and FDNY uh, at the table with their experts as well. Next slide. So uh, just to give an overview of the, the current landscape for battery permitting overall, um, Again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the city at large um, and, of course, the, the DOB and the processes to obtain uh, construction and electrical permits. Um, but because of the uh, lack of code considerations in the current code cycle, uh, DOB's OTCR Office of Technical Certification and Research um, has to look at these projects a, a little more in-depthly uh, along with FDNY. Um, and uh, as a part of our guide, uh, there were major sections as well that we broke up uh, for, for categories to understand um, kind of the, the major considerations broken down into, into these categories that you can see. The so life cycle management uh, for kind of, uh, the beginning of a project throughout to the end of uh, potentially recycling or removing batteries uh, at their end of life. Um, all the way down to signage specifics and, and what needs to be included on those signs uh, among, among all the safety uh, categories that we have as well. Slide. Um, well, and, and that being said, of course, the 9548 data is ongoing and is what the agencies are really looking for to, to understand exactly um, the Kind of impacts that these requirements will have on on various sites, um, and data is coming. Uh, these processes are underway, um, and it it does seem to be moving forward in a in a productive way with with a lot of um, people at the table trying to understand exactly the process, let alone how to read the data and understand it and and its impacts on on the requirements. So, uh, for the overall process, starting with the DOB's PW1 and construction permits initiation, uh, you do also have to submit to OTCR at the same time, uh, and then it goes through a review process, uh, uh, pretty lengthy, um, a little bit of a back and forth uh, with the developers and applicants, uh, and the office does work directly with um, the the project developers um, to go over specific site conditions uh, as, as well as coordinating with with SDNY um, and you can see 
uh, even even down to OTCR's uh, final acceptance letter, uh, there are going to be major considerations with FDNY as well, uh, and they release a, a letter of no objections uh, at the same time. Um, and there are some major forms, of course, uh, let alone the initiating construction forms for the just standard construction permit, electrical permits. Um, there are specific OTCR forms, and this is just a sample of their checklist and major considerations to include in a submission. Um, of course, there's going to be various fees and various other forms uh, needed at the same time, uh, OTCR2 being one, um, and then also FDNY forms um, to initiate on their end as well. Let's see on the next slide. Uh, the TM1 being the initiating form for them, but of course uh, also running into various other paperwork depending on kind of project specifics like uh, ventilation details and whatnot. Um, but fees required at the time of submission as well um, on, on FDNY's end. So hopefully this looks uh, familiar to most of you. Um, this is more of a interagency flowchart between um, FDNY DOB, but as well as the utility and Con Ed, and kind of the processes that are required to go through throughout a project's uh, application and installation. Um, of course, the guide breaks down projects into three different sizes uh, with under 20 kilowatt hours between 20 and 250 kilowatt hours and large systems over 250 kilowatt hours. Um, and the process being different for the larger system. So a little bit more in depth of a review, the idea, the idea being that smaller systems uh, will, will not have as many safety considerations and impacts as a lot of these larger systems. And of course, the coordination between DOB and FDNY being um, re really important, especially in the initial phases of, of the design, um, down to yeah, down to the installation and um, potentially a, a way to have a, a yearly review, a three-year review, um, just to keep uh, project safety checks in place um, and to make sure that facility managers are, are also keeping up with systems. Um, and, and overall, just the kind of a background on, on where a lot of these standards have come from, um, they, they are really great standards and a basis to, to check back against when, when trying to design these systems. Um, again, of course, 9548 still being a large influence and will either reinforce or change the outcome of certain requirements within the guide. Um, but overall, uh, Pulling from national bodies such as NFPA 855, um, the drafts of IFC for 2021, um, somewhat in 2018, uh, some good resources for, for the way that even national standards are going for uh, battery installation, as well as, of course, the, the actual subject matter expertise of the agencies themselves. And, and as mentioned, DNBGO's uh, uh, wealth of knowledge and experience on on uh, battery systems at large, as well as uh, testing considerations. With that, um, I hand it over to Mike. Take it off for going into 9540A and, uh, and our projects now with FDNY and DOB. Hey guys, can everybody hear me now? Uh, um, yes, now we can hear you. All right. Beautiful. Uh, thanks guys for teeing this up. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. And I apologize, my voice is a little rough right now. Uh, I get so excited talking about large scale testing in 9540A that uh, it kind of burns my voice out after a while. But uh, so large scale fire testing is currently required for all energy storage projects submitted in New York City. 
Uh, it's understood that in New York City, large-scale fire tests will be conducted using the methodology outlined in UL 9540A. Uh, so this 9540A data will be used to evaluate the fire characteristics of an energy storage system undergoing thermal runaway. And this data generated uh, may be used to determine the fire and explosion protection required for an EFS installation, uh, space in between units, et cetera. Go to the next slide. So UL has provided a series of flowcharts, and Victoria will be taking a look at that later with you guys. Um, what we've noticed is that there are uh, some gaps in in how the data will be utilized and looked at by the AHJs, and those are the, uh, the remaining open questions that you see outlined in blue. So what calculations or modeling uh, are useful for data, uh, data analysis? What potential impacts and mitigation strategies um, can be put in place? And then how the AHJs are going to be looking at this and how can we make their life easier uh, um, in, in setting some sort of uh, values or conditions uh, to streamline the process. Um, <clears throat> go to the next slide. Uh, so goals and process. Uh, the overarching goal of this project is to develop a transparent uh, permitting guide for energy storage systems in New York City. Uh, it'll be essentially adding to the outdoor guide that Derek was addressing earlier. Uh, this is essentially part two, where the gaps in that guide will be filled by uh, this large-scale fire task data utilization. Uh, so every week we'll bring FDNY and y and DOB uh, to the table, We're working with them to communicate the current process for technical legal units, emissions, exposure analysis, uh, mitigation measures. How are they looking at these at these uh, submittals? And then just looking to to develop those uh, further if needed. We're also bringing in uh, subject matter experts, SMEs, to provide guidance and key technical and practical knowledge to the AHJs during this process. So our role in this is essentially to facilitate these, these uh, discussions and to document the process. We're not looking to develop any standards, uh, things like that. We're just looking to document their process so we can streamline uh, your guys' uh, uh, process for, for submitting uh, projects in New York City. Can go to the next slide. Uh, so we've identified five major topic areas. Um, and so each, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to how these are broken up later, but if you go to the next slide, we're looking at explosion right now. <clears throat> but there are also, we'll also be looking at, oh, go back, sorry. Uh, we'll also be looking at thermal runaway, fire spread, toxicity, and then performance-based design. And so that's the, the modeling that, that we're taking into account to, for uh, varying installation environment system sizes, different mitigation strategies, looking at what the validated models are, uh, definition of worst case scenario, et cetera. Okay, go to the next one. So for each of these topic areas, we've been breaking them into a three-week cycle. Uh, the first week is what we're calling our ground week meeting, and that's with the AHJs and some core subject matter experts in each topic area. Uh, so we've done that, we, we started on March 20th, and then we've gone to the second week now, which uh, our case study meeting with AHJs, developers and manufacturers, uh, we, we, where different projects are being um, sort of presented as case studies and looking at how this data can be utilized and looking at real, wor real world examples. Um, and then of course the second week, uh, are these stakeholder updates, which we're having right now. There will be five of them for each, uh, or one for each of the five topic areas uh, to update stakeholders, uh, and provide a platform for questions and input. Uh, this next week, week three, will be a conclusions meeting with the AHJs. Uh, look at all the things we've talked about, see if there are any remaining issues, um, and kind of just what, what the conclusions are. And uh, with that, Let's uh, leave we'll over to Victoria. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, so
So, you know, as, as Derek and Mike set up, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to move through this in as uh, organized a method as possible. Um, we recognize that there's potentially some confusion or frustration in the industry. And, you know, as part of this process, we want to make sure that you know what tools you have available right now um, to move forward, as Derek was talking through what process we're going through um, and trying to get to the end goal of uh, providing a little bit more guidance on how to analyze this test data. And then finally, you know, a, an overarching conclusion um, to, to really um, solidify the process um, and document the process so that it's transparent and clear to everyone. So as part of that, um, we're, we're looking through, as, as Mike had referenced, um, from the UL 9540A data through analysis to permitting requirements. Um, so this middle step of how do you analyze the data is what we're, we're grappling with now in these three-week sessions. So in this first session, as, as Mike had noted, um, we're working on explosion analysis. And so the very first step that we went through was defining the hazard um, and then discussing the various mitigation strategies that are acceptable for that hazard. And then we, we have to dive through how does the data inform addressing that hazard through those mitigation strategies. So on the left-hand side, you can see the noted hazards of, you know, first that there's a failure and it cascades and it's undetected and, um, you know, it propagates to a worse condition. Second, that if it's cascading, that there's going to be gases released um, from the batteries um, failing, and those gases may uh, may end up having uh, local concentrations of the lower flammability limit reached. Um, if that occurs, there's a risk of an explosion, um, in, in which case that explosion or deflagration event could cause injury to p people who are in the facility or near the, the building or who are responding um, to, to an event, um, either by pressure, heat, or flying debris. And then finally, you know, after, after the situation is essentially managed, there still may be trapped gases in the area. So these are sort of the, the key areas of concern um, and hazards that we want to make sure are managed um, and, and uh, for the explosion topic itself, um, and recognizing that there is some overlap between all of these topics and, um, you know, understanding that, you know, heat and flame impact, there's heat and flame that needs to be considered for uh, flame spread, but also that it impacts the explosion analysis. So on the right-hand side, you can see the mitigation strategies that were discussed and considered. So, you know, first of all, you can you can work to make sure that you're detecting failures and that you're monitoring conditions by having sensors monitoring and UL1973 testing, which is intended to demonstrate uh, the prevention of cascading failures. Um, the core of this analysis, though, is around the UL9540A output um, and the design based on that. So that output can um, help you design ventilation strategies um, to maintain the LFL below the, the dangerous levels. Um, it can help you design uh, deflagration venting. Now, primarily right now, it's being determined to be upward in order to um, not pose a risk to first responders. Um, it can help you to design spacing and barriers that are appropriate to prevent further cascading of failures. Um, and it can help you to design some suppression measures, which may um, reduce the likelihood of an explosion or, you know, as I was noting, there's some overlap. So that, that would um, touch on the flammability aspect. And then finally, to manage the, the, uh, the gases post-event, um, you can use exhaust procedures. Um, there can be first responder uh, guidance for uh, protective breathing apparatus, um, as well as how, how, how will they impact the event um, once they're on site, and uh, can we quantify that? You can go to the next slide. Thanks. So, like Mike mentioned, these quote unquote flowcharts. So, these flowcharts are intended to, um, they were developed by UL um, and they're intended to address the, the and create a, essentially a stopgap between the end of the testing and the data report that comes out of that to the permitting process because there's some amount of analysis that needs to be done in order to calculate the ventilation strategies the suppression strategies, the explosive impact, um, just as I was mentioning on the other page. So there are three separate flowcharts that they developed. The first um, accounts for thermal runaway and intermodule propagation, um, and I'll, I'll show these on the following slides. The second um, is around full system flame propagation and, and takes into account mitigation strategies for that 
uh, propagation, and so that's the quote unquote installation test uh, from the from the UL 9540A test um, methodology. So the first this first flowchart is cell module and unit test, and then the second one is around the installation test. And then the third flowchart, which is the one we're going to talk about a little, in a little bit more detail today, is the explosion and deflag protection um, flowchart. So you can just click ahead, Daniela. So this slide is the thermal runaway one, and I know it's a little bit of an eye chart. It's hard to read here, um, but I just want to show these to you. We won't go into detail into this one or the next one today um, because we're focusing on the explosion level. Um, but you can see sort of here on the left-hand side, cell level in the in the uh, rectangular blocks all the way on the left, cell level test, module level test, and unit level test. So there are various um, gates in those tests to determine what the next step would be. You can go to the next slide. This next slide, I think, is more of an eye chart, um, but it's talking through the fire propagation. So this is the installation level test. So if you go pass through all of the gates on the previous flow chart, you then could proceed to an installation level test where you would ascertain the effectiveness of uh, mitigation and uh, suppression agents. You can go to the next slide. And then this is the final chart. So this is the explosion and deflag protection chart. Um, this is the chart that we're going to be talking about in a little bit more detail today, um, although just uh, since we're giving a essential, essentially a status update of how far we've gotten to date, um, we haven't gotten proceeded through the entirety of this chart yet. So we'll just be focusing on the portions that we've touched on so far. But you start up at the top with uh, output values from various tests that you've conducted in the UL 9540A um, methodology testing suite. And then you proceed through various uh, vetted calculation methods um, to help you to, to determine if there's an explosion risk. Um, and if there is an explosion risk, how is it being managed? And if it's being managed effectively, or if other mitigation strategies need to be considered. So you can go to the next slide. So I want to talk about sort of the progress to date around the explosion analysis. So we started right up at the top of the chart. We started with the definition section, just as a starting point to talk about um, what are the data sources that we're, that we're going to be chewing on. Um, so one of the questions that's come up a lot is, you know, if I, if I pursue a cell level test and, you know, based on that analysis that there's, you know, not necessarily determined risk, um, what do we do with that data? What, what's the next step that we take? Um, and the answer is that you have to put it into the context of its enclosure, of, um, of the uh, conditions in which it's going to be installed. Um, and, and then you also want to take into consideration the gas properties that have come out in result of that test. So if you go to the next slide, these, these are sort of the, the key discussion areas that we've walked through or that we've, we have um, around the, the data sources. So very first thing is the actual source of the data. So is the source of the data for the explosion calculation, cell, module, unit, or installation level? Um, is there an approved list of laboratories that can conduct these data, um, these, these tests, and therefore produce data that's acceptable to the authorities having jurisdiction? And then the applicability and assumptions around that data. So what if there's variability in the system design? What if um, the installation is uh, in a field versus inside of a, um, a building? Um, the assumption on first responder impact, can you consider um, you know, the application of water by a first responder to be one of the mitigation strategies? Um, how, if the test is terminated, can we analyze that data? Um, and then finally, is there, is there any impact from a risk analysis? So if you go to the next slide, the items that are bolded and highlighted in blue um, are the items that we've talked through. And again, as, as Mike noted, you know, in this process, it's an iter iterative process, um, and we haven't reached any conclusions yet. But these are the items that we've talked through um, and have started to have a little bit more clarity in how we might be able to proceed. So, you know, the first piece of information that I want to share with you um, around this discussion is um, regarding the source of data. So we did have a discussion about, you know, the, the data that comes out of the cell versus the module versus the unit versus the installation test, how, how and why is it applied to the explosion analysis. 
And from our initial conversations, um, again, these aren't finalized conclusions, but from the initial conversations, uh, the cell level test is going to be used to determine the concentrations, the relative concentrations and composition of the gas mixture that's coming out of a, of a burn. Um, so that concentration, when you're doing your explosion analysis, or those relative concentrations when you're doing your explosion analysis, would be applied to the volume of gas that is measured from either the module unit or installation level test. Um, the reason that I'm saying module unit or installation level test is if it is determined in testing that the module um, doesn't won't, won't propagate, um, you would use the volume of gases from that module level test um, to determine the total volume of gases that would be released in a fire event. If it's determined that you need to continue on to the unit level test, you would use the total volume of gases released from that unit level test to do the explosion analysis. And there's some discussion about um, the impact that mitigation measures have on that volume of gases. And so there's some discussion about if you can use the installation level test rather than the unit level test. So the, the sort of key takeaway that, again, it's not finalized, but just to keep you up to date on where the conversation is starting, um, is that the compositions, relative compositions from the cell, are um, applied to the volumes that are measured from the larger system test. Regarding the approved list of laboratories, um, this again is, I, I'll continue to give this caveat, these are ongoing conversations, this is only week two, um, but it's been determined that based on uh, the past history of code and standards requirements in New York City, that the Department of Buildings is responsible for ascertaining the uh, approved labs um, based on the methodologies that have previously been used to approve labs. Now there's a little bit of a wrinkle here in that the UL 9540A testing methodology is not yet um, an ANSI approved standard that has certification for laboratories for it. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, typically speaking, any laboratory could conduct this test as long as it follows um, and documents it following the sort of letter of the law of the, of the test itself. However, for New York City, we want to make sure that we can validate the results and that the tests are being done by quality um, and otherwise certified laboratories. Um, so DOB is currently going through a process to determine um, what types of proof um, and what types of certification or accreditation would be required for the laboratories to accept the data from. So it's recognized that it's you know, an issue and it's important to understand where you can go and who's, whose data you can trust, um, and, and we're working on addressing that. Regarding uh, the variability in system design, um, there's some initial discussion around the use and application of data from one uh, unit test to another unit test, or one cell test to another cell test. Um, again, you know, these are ongoing conversations, but some of the conversation has um, been around, you know, wanting to make sure that you're efficient in your testing processes. So say you have a module, two modules from the same manufacturer, they use the same cells, but one is scaled larger and one is scaled smaller. Say one has half the number of cells in it that the other has in it a different power or energy capacity. Since it's using the same cells and it's using the same form factor, but just in a smaller condition, uh, a discussion right now is being made around if it's possible to apply the quote unquote worst case scenario, so the larger modules results, and therefore the larger uh, modules being installed in a rack and, and being uh, tested in the unit level test, to apply those results to the smaller module either directly saying now you have a very conservative assessment of the volume of gases that could be released, or by uh, scaling down um, from, that, from that larger uh, module burn and making the assumption that there's some amount of uh, reduction in gases because you're going to a smaller module burn. So currently there's a discussion in place. We've, in the case studies uh, that we walked through this week, there were two different um, strategies that were used to pursue that. The two that I've just noted, either applying directly the larger test, the larger module test data to a smaller uh, installation, or scaling that data down. And finally, uh, what we've discussed regarding risk analysis results implications. Um, 
because 9540A um, provides you with essentially hard, hard data upon which you can base uh, spacing designs, protection designs, um, response time needs, uh, explosion protection needs, ventilation needs. Um, and then you can do quantitative calculations to ascertain the applicability to various different sites. Um, it's currently the opinion of the authorities that that really provides you all you need. You're integrating essentially that risk, that site specific risk analysis into the um, the quantitative data that's coming out of the UL 9540A test. So right now there's a little bit of a discussion around the necessity of producing an additional document um, around risk analysis. Uh, since, since the authorities are planning to make their decisions on permitting around the hard data provided by the UL 9540A test. You can go to the next slide. So um, actually, Danielle, can you go back like Three slides back to the this flow chart. Yeah, one more. Oh, yeah. So um, we were just talking about this upper right-hand corner, these definitions, and really it's the whole upper section, including um, this use of flammable gas mixture, um, this oval at the top. Uh, we're skipping the middle piece right now, and then we'll be proceeding right down to this bottom piece where we're talking about um, the the results the end results of this analysis. So just to give you guys a very quick high-level overview, we're taking data from the testing right at the top, and the idea is that you're moving through um, an explosion analysis first by determining what, um, what gases are coming out and uh, the various compositions of those gases and determining if that mixture reaches 25% uh, of the LFL of the mixture. Then continuing onward, if it does, um, you are going to go through an NFPA 68 type analysis um, to determine from there the, the pressure that would come out uh, from a, an explosion event or uh, um, in case the, the, the gases within the ca container catch on fire and then have a deflagration event. So then you proceed down through this middle portion where you're doing that, 90, uh, that uh, NFPA 68 analysis or 69 analysis depending on uh, the methodology you want to use, and then you come down to the bottom where you determine essentially what the hazard is, um, and and then you've got these two different routes, whether the hazard is acceptably mitigated or whether it's not. So I just wanted to give you sort of the overarching view, and uh, Danielle, you can click forward again to the, the zoom in on that one section. Perfect. Thank you. So this is the zoom in on after you've done the NFPA 68, and right now we're talking about moving through it in an NFPA 68 analysis. You come down to this first box saying that explosion mitigation is necessary. So if it's been determined that the pressures are such and the LFL concentrations are such that there may be an explosion and explosion mitigation is therefore necessary, you would move on to um, handling it through deflagration venting, which is the way that NFPA 68 handles it. And so from those vents, there's an expectation of a fire block fireball and a blast wave coming out of those vents in the worst case scenario. And if it's determined that those uh, that fireball and blast wave are not a threat to uh, nearby buildings and people, you would find the deflagration to be acceptable per NFPA 68. Or if not, you would have to choose an additional deflagration suppression system. So if you go to the next slide. So the questions that we've asked around this are, one, what are acceptable mitigation strategies? So it's been discussed around meeting or exceeding NFPA 68 and 69. Um, and so we wanted to understand if there was a required order for that analysis or if, uh, if the designer could be left to determine which was most appropriate. And then the an another question that has been, I think one of the questions that at least for me has come up again and again is how do you define what is a threat? Um, because the flowchart just says, is there a threat to nearby buildings and people? Um, and so this is very, uh, this is a very different consideration for if the container is in the middle of a field and it's 100 feet away from everything versus if it's being placed right next to a residential property. So, um, and it's a very different threat if it's an unoccupied space typically or if it's a space that has a lot of traffic and through, through um, 
and, and bystanders or, or people passing through the space. Um, so it's important to understand how threat is defined. Um, so there's, if you click to the next slide. So I'm highlighting here, um, and I'll come back to the acceptable mitigation strategies in a second, but we've highlighted here cite, cited definitions. So there's a few different ways that hazards are defined in, in appropriate uh, you know, reference literature. So there's, um, there's some government sources um, from NOAA, um, there's the, the Fire Protection Engineers Handbook, um, and there's also NFPA 68 itself. So just giving an example here of NFPA 68, there's something called the quote-unquote hazard zone. It helps you determine what the fireball dimensions are, but then there's no additional uh, details on that fireball dimension. Does that mean if you've calculated the fireball dimension, um, and then here uh, that the hazard zone is 0.5 of the axial distance from the vent um, once you've done this calculation. If you've calculated that, does that just mean you can put, you know, a swing set right at that edge? Or does that mean that there needs to be some factor of safety? Is there some additional determination that goes into pressure or um, pressure or heat impacts on people versus if you have this sited next to um, the back cinder block wall of a factory or um, or other industrial facility that has no windows on it. Um, and so right now we're pulling the citations that we can find and reference in um, you know, respected literature as examples of how can we potentially define what a hazard zone is and how can we outline from there what, and you can see below, we haven't gotten into this discussion yet, but what factor of safety um, do you wanna place on top of that, that, uh, that definition of what a hazard is? We talked before about uh, the risk analysis. Um, this is just HMA, it's just sort of another term for it, the hazard mitigation analysis. And I do wanna bring it up again, as you know, it's been something that's under discussion is potentially not necessary if you're completing the UL9548 testing and a complete analysis of the impact of that test. So to go back up to the, the first bullet point around acceptable mitigation strategies, we have been discussing um, you know, right now, the flowchart walks through uh, compliance with NFPA 68. We've been discussing um, alternative or potentially more conservative methodologies that may also be acceptable. Um, we've also been discussing and, and the validation of those methodologies and the necessary proof to validate that. We've also been discussing, is it, is it acceptable or possible to utilize NFPA 69 instead or some other ventilation strategy, therefore meaning that the uh, LFL never reaches the 25% LFL quantity that determines that there now is an explosion risk and you have to go through NFPA 68 design mitigation measures. So that's currently in discussion of, you know, is there a required order? How much freedom can we give designers to design applicably to their, their specific system based on the data that they have um, and um, based on the installation and the, the, the known risks in that installation. So you can go to the next slide. So this is the last slide I think in our deck um, and apologies if uh, there's, there's some more that was added behind it. But I just wanted to identify at least for this portion the next step. So, we obviously have a bunch of open questions. You saw only, only about half of the items were highlighted in blue. Um, so, and those, those are still actively being discussed, um, but they've been raised. So there are the items, the questions that were open um, in the previous slides are the ones that were remaining in black and not bolded. But in addition to that, we have that entire middle of the chart that we still need to walk through. And there's a few questions from that that we wanna make sure that we identify. So. How is the volume of container defined? I think it's pretty clear and apparent if you've got a large outdoor container. But once you start putting maybe closed racks inside of a warehouse, it becomes a little bit less clear. Do you use the volume of the warehouse? Do you use the volume of the rack? Is there some in between that needs to be determined? Um, the, there are a few points in the flowchart where it points to no deflagration hazard or no explosion hazard defined. Um, and we're looking to find out if that's a sort of a route out of the path or do you have to continue down the analysis. Um, there is an allowance in NFPA 68 for deformation, but 
and there's different calculations that go around if deformation of the container is permitted. Um, but what we want to understand is, is that acceptable to the local authorities? Um, and furthermore, on the container specifications, if you're customizing a container with customized deflagration vents, that now changes potentially the rating that the container might have come with. So how is it acceptable to validate the, the outcome ratings of this new custom designed container? Um, we do want to, as we've mentioned, um, we want to understand how first responders, responders are expected to respond to events and therefore if that has any impact on the analysis and how is the worst case scenario defined? So that's really tying back into what is the threat? Um, and I've highlighted here in blue, you know, if there's additional questions from those on the call, if there's some areas that you have concerns in or you've run into trouble with um, that you wanna make sure that is being addressed. Um, so, you know, essentially, we're gonna be continuing our discussion next week on this topic. We're working towards conclusions as much as possible, but we recognize that this is topic one of a five topic uh, five topic spread and you know we're, we're having lessons learned on how is best to uh, to work through these topics and get the information for these topics to the HJs if they need to make their decisions um, so there may be some delay in getting the conclusions together um, but we're going to get as far as we can uh, on explosion as of next week so we're looking you know one for questions from you Two, if you have any additional data or reference material that you can share um, in the form of a case study, it's always welcome, both on this topic and others. And then we're just going to start preparing for the next topic area. So um, I'll hand it back over to Danielle, who's moderating, and um, thank you guys so much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria, uh, and also Mike and Derek. Um, we have gotten in a handful of questions. Um, so we'll uh, start off with the ones that we have, but um, please definitely feel free to submit uh, any other questions also through the uh, question box. You can also submit them through the chat box if that may be easier. Um, and we should have uh, plenty of time to get through them. Um, as far as the question facilitation, I will uh, just hand that off to my colleague, Ron Reisman. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we have uh, a couple of questions in so far, and I would invite uh, everybody on this call to uh, to send others in now. Uh, but let's get to the ones that we have uh, right now. So, our first question has to do with uh, grid tied energy storage systems less than 20 kilowatt hours and UPS, UPS based systems. And the question is whether those systems are exempt from the uh, New York City Department of Building permitting steps that uh, Derek outlined earlier. So since Derek is our resident DOB expert, I'll uh, turn that over to him. Yeah, sure. Um, so ESS systems at large are not exempt from the process considering 9540A. Um, so, of course, uh, they are smaller systems and there is talk about uh, a different pathway for them at some point. But again, all energy storage systems right now are needing to go through 9540A uh, to, to get this data to influence the, the future of what permitting um, can be. Um, in terms of UPS systems, they do not. So depending on the chemistry utilized, um, UPS systems are covered by the code and lead, valve regulated lead acid are covered by the code um, and can be installed through the regular permitting process uh, within the city. Um, and, and as well as some, some lithium ion chemistries are also uh, within the code, but um, they do not have to go through this process that we are outlining right now, as well as the permitting with OTCR and, and FDNY um, in, in the same way that that was outlined previously. Okay, thanks, Derek. And if you'll stay on the line, uh, this next question I think is uh, something you can address as well. It has to do with testing labs and their accreditation. Um, and our questioner is asking whether any labs have been accredited thus far or whether they're waiting, uh, awaiting DOB criteria before receiving formal accreditation. That's a good question. Uh, it actually might be better if Victoria goes into that. Um, she knows a little bit more of the technical details. 
um, okay. and, and it has um, been discussed. Yeah, sure. And and um, I was just going to say, I'm not sure when the question was sent in, so maybe it was addressed already in the portion of the presentation where I talked about it. But the long and the short is, is that, no, there hasn't been any lab accredited. Um, UL, because they designed um, the, the testing methodology, right now is, of course, you know, the most experienced in executing it. Um, it has been proposed that, you know, labs that are otherwise accredited by DOB for other tests um, might be on the short list or nationally recognizing nationally recognized testing laboratories might be on the short list. But no, right now, DOB is working on developing essentially a set of criteria um, because because labs can't be accredited for this this methodology right now because it's not a it's not a, a formalized standard yet. Um, I hope that helps address the question. Okay, thanks, Victoria. And as long as we have you on the line now, uh, someone uh, wanted a clarification on a comment you made earlier uh, regarding uh, when HMA is not required based on completion of UL 9540A and explosion analysis. Uh, the questioner says he was uh, under the assumption that uh, an HMA was required for all system permits and that the UL 9540A data was only a part of that hazard mitigation analysis. Can you, can you clarify that? Yep, certainly. Um, so this is one of the areas that's currently under discussion. Um, and essentially, if you're taking the UL 9540A data, and running it through a full data analysis. So right now we're just talking about explosions, but there's you know flame spread, thermal runaway, uh, toxicity, et cetera. There's a number of other considerations that uh, would help impact the eventual outcome of that data analysis. Um, so the idea here is that if you have that hard data, that you can do the analysis directly on that, and you don't have to do an additional analysis on top of that, a quali you know a more qualitative analysis. Um, and Sort of the background theory behind that is that HMA are typically based on, you know, known failure rates and things like that. And um, and there's some there's some discussion right now with the AHJs that without a body a larger body of test data to reference, that the best thing to reference is the direct data that's applicable to that system, so the UL9548 test data. Um, I do want to underline that right now we're we're sharing the in process conversations, so that hasn't reached a formal conclusion. It's just something that was being bandied about as, you know, if, if we don't have to require an additional document from applicants, you know, we can lift that burden. Um, so it's, it's in discussion. It's not finalized. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, now also, uh, I guess this one uh, goes to you, Victoria. Uh, questioner asks whether we still need deflagration panels if we can maintain off gases below LFL by a, ventila by a ventilation system? Um, yeah, so the, the short answer is, is that that's, they're open to that, um, that strategy. Um, there's currently some uh, speculation on whether or not the, the ventilation can happen um, to a significant enough extent to maintain it over an extended period of time below the 25% uh, LFL. Um, and that's, that's sort of why there's, it, again, like I said, you know, I apologize for all the caveats, but it is an ongoing discussion. Um, and it's raised essentially as, you know, if a, if a certified designer is coming in and saying, I can manage these off gases that we've determined from UL 9548 testing um, through ventilation rather than through deflag panels, I should be able to do that, and and that's a that's something that the HJs are open to, and um, we're working to you know come to a conclusion with them on that. Okay, and just to go back to the the, the previous question about HMAs, uh, somebody uh, also asked for clarification: uh, what is an HMA? Sure, um, I would definitely direct you to take a a, a look at uh, the. Uh, international fire code and the definitions that they have in there, um, especially in the 2018 version, the most recent version. Um, I'm, I, I might <laughs> bungle this a little bit, but it stands for hazard mitigation analysis. So um, essentially you're taking into account the various factors um, that, that um, could fail or have an issue, and then the cascading impact of that issue on um, both the, the equipment and, and uh, the local conditions. So you're, you're looking at your hazards, you're determining appropriate mitigation levels, and then you're determining if those mitigation levels have addressed the hazards. 
Okay, thanks. There were a lot of acronyms uh, during this webinar. In fact, earlier on, somebody asked a question uh, about uh, uh, what are AHJs, uh, and we responded offline by saying, well, AHJs are like the FDNY and DOB, and I just thought it was wonderful that we were answering a question about an acronym with more acronyms. But anyway, getting back to the more substantive questions here, um, someone is asking whether flow batteries have to go through 9540A testing too. Um, this is Victoria again. I guess the short answer right now is yes. Um, the slightly longer answer is, you know, the practical implementation of that is not yet clear. Um, so, so yeah, the short answer is, is that, you know, it's required across all batteries, but the longer answer is that because lithium ion batteries are the most, um, the most commonly installed battery right now, uh, or the most common battery for applications in New York City right now, um, that there certainly has been a little bit more of a focus on that. So um, this is one of the one of the questions that we have that we're going to be bringing up is the applicability to various different system types. Okay. Um, another one that uh, that that just come in. This is this is a, a a bit involved. So so bear with me as I as I read through this. Uh, questioner is asking how volumes for explosion analysis are being considered, and does it take into account stratification of flammable gases or localization inside a larger ESS volume? Uh, questioner says that we've also seen that deployment of clean agents can reduce the effective volume of the system and the reintroduction of oxygen can lead to explosion. Um, there's a lot there and uh, I don't know, Victoria uh, or Mike, do you want to jump on that? Yeah, certainly. Um, so the, the answer is a little bit complicated. It is certainly an open conversation and that's why one of the questions that remains is that you saw on that uh, the next step list is um, how is volume of a container defined? So, you know, do you have to consider the volume changing if you've deployed, say, a clean agent and now you've um, compressed the gases into a much smaller state? Or even with a not a clean agent, with a water suppression system, if the water is um, pushing the gases uh, up um, away from the cool air. Um, so, at, at its most basic level, um, I believe that they're utilizing right now uh, a more simplistic uh, model around that, and so it's a, it's expected to be essentially a, a homogeneous mixture of the gases um, and uh, to the stoichiometric concentrations within the container itself. Um, Mike, I'm not sure is the uh, is the volume of the like uh, the missing volume essentially uh, from the rack. Is that taken out of the volume calculation? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, when we were discussing about container volume, uh, do you subtract the volume of the rack based on NFPA 68? Um, I'm actually not uh, sure how to the, the answer to that. Um, I know that is okay. under um, sort of speculation. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my first advice would be, you know, for the questioners, um, take a detailed look at NFPA 68 and the requirements therein. Um, but right now, my understanding is that it's a, it's a more um, homogeneous mixture, um, and it's not necessarily taking into account um, various uh, local effects. And so this is an open conversation, and this is why we want to talk about volume of container, because, you know, it's in, in a single container, it's certainly at issue, but then if you're talking about the localized effects in say a warehouse um, and having one module go in one corner, you know, you're not going to reach the LSL for a really long time, but it's recognized practically that you can have an explosive atmosphere locally. So, yeah, that's an ongoing conversation. 
Okay. Uh, by the way, one of the advantages of the of the webinar format is that uh, we have participants who can uh, um, answer questions or or at least provide some additional clarification. And we'd like to thank Adam from UL for uh, jumping on uh, an earlier question related to the the flow batteries. Uh, and what Adam is telling us is that UL 9540A is going into its fourth edition and aims to include new guidance for flow battery testing. So, Adam, thanks for providing that uh, that additional information. Um, we have a question that's uh, come in here about the uh, the. Uh, data that's being collected, and they want to know if there will be an effort to collect and anonymize all the data so that future testing will not be required. And while everyone is looking up anonymize, uh, we'll... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a answer a question that we can answer at this point. It's really up to the authorities how they want to proceed. I think if we look back at like you know the history of code development, it's often based on a body of data, and then you eventually get the prescriptive requirements based on that body of data that's been collected. Um, but you know we're really in early days right now, so um, you know I think that's a really great future future um, that we can strive for to get, you know, consistent prescriptive requirements, at least for a large bulk of systems. But, you know, that's not something that's, you know, right now on the radar. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, Victoria. I'd like to point out, by the way, that Victoria and I uh, graduated from the same college in New Jersey, uh, and the similarity <laughs> between us ends there. Um, so, uh, this uh, question just came in, but it does sort of go back to something uh, that we talked about earlier with regard to accre uh, accreditation for labs, and they're asking whether uh, DOB will accept approval of UL 9540A from accredited labs outside of New York City. We don't have the answer for you right now, but since we're continuing the accredited lab conversation, we'll, we can certainly bring up that particular question um, as a facet of, of, you know, potentially a way to validate the, the accreditation of a lab. Okay, thanks, Victoria. Um, that is it right now uh, for any questions. Uh, you can you can uh, continue to submit questions to us. Probably the best way to do it uh, is to do it uh, by email after this is over from the um, uh, to the, uh, the 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 smart DG Hub uh, mailbox, um, which is uh, dghub at cuny.edu. Correct. Ah, uh, yes, that's correct. Smart DG. Hub okay. Hub. So right. So 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 if anyone has any additional questions, send them to us um, at uh, Smart DG Hub uh, at cuny.edu, and uh, we will get back. We will also. Someone asked a, a question here about whether uh, this webinar will be made available. Yes, we are recording it for posterity, and we will be posting it. Uh, on our website so that you can go back and revisit it if you jumped in late and missed a section or want to hear something again, uh, you'll be able to do that. So we will send out notice of where that recording can be found. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Daniela now for a wrap-up. Uh, okay. There's, uh, I guess, not much to wrap up. Thank you all very much um, for participating. Um, again, if you have uh, additional questions, you could just send them over to us, and we will definitely do our best to get back to you uh, in a timely uh, manner. Um, and to keep uh, updated on <clears throat> uh, our, you know, additional activities as we're going through uh, this, uh, you know, multi multi week process. Um, we, I definitely encourage everybody to visit our website. That is nysolarmap.com um, under the uh, energy storage uh, category on our page. I uh, apologize that I didn't um, put up a uh, screenshot of where to uh, navigate to get to our website, um, but I can certainly provide that uh, via email as well. 
Um, and we also hope you'll be able to join us uh, for the subsequent webinars. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier on, um, we'll be holding, this is one of a series of five. Um, they'll be held every roughly third week. Um, and uh, you'll be getting the uh, registration links again. Uh, Registration is a little bit awkward because we had to uh, were unable to provide one registration link for all five webinars. Um, so if you do want to sign up for the subsequent ones, just to make sure that you register for each of those uh, individually. Um, thank you all very much, and uh, we hope you'll join us on, in three weeks from now. Take care.